Well, it's a pleasure to be back with you tonight. I hope you had a great day. I certainly did. Several had uh, suggested to me yesterday that I ought to go out and visit the Will Rogers house, and Russ took me out there today, and I really enjoyed seeing that, and I grew up understanding, uh, you know, that saying of Will Rogers, I never met a man I didn't like. He, of course, never met my brother. That would have changed things for him, I believe. But uh, what a great man he was. Uh, and uh, what a memory and legacy he has left for all of us. Well, it's Monday. I think uh, I'll start off with a little light humor uh, this evening. Because this is Monday night and you've had a hard day starting the week. I want to tell you the story of the forgetful preacher. And uh, this does not reflect upon Russ or me or anyone present here. But this old guy was so forgetful that he would have to write everything down or he'd just space it out. And so he got to where he would carry notebooks with him so that he could consult them to remember everything. He was preaching at a place uh, on one occasion and uh, after it was over, he was standing in the back and greeting people. And this big old burly fella, I mean, he was huge, came up to him and looked down at him. And he said, Preacher, did you attend uh, Abilene Christian University? And the preacher said, just a minute. He pulled out a notebook. Uh, kindergarten, elementary school, high school. Yeah, he said, I attended Abilene Christian. Did you date a girl by the name of Gertrude McGillicuddy? Just a minute. They pull out another notebook. And dates. Uh, Gertrude. Yes, I dated Gertrude. Did you kiss her? Pulled out another notebook. Holding hands, hugs, kisses. Yeah, I kissed her, he said. And the big guy said, well, I married her and I don't like it. And the preacher looked at his notebook and he said, you know what? I didn't like it either. <laughs> it's one way of getting out of trouble, I suppose. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 3 because we want to talk about loving one another tonight. 1 John chapter 3. And John has a lot to say about love. And we'll take a look at verses 11 through 18. Verse 11 through 18 of 1 John chapter 3. I'll be reading from the New American Standard, and now you all know why. It's the one Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. It's a good version. Yours is good too, so read on with me. Verse 11. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one, and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Do not marvel, brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and beholds his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We'll stop there. Now, to study love is really to study the priority of God, I believe. I think that love reigns supreme over everything that the scriptures have to say. And there are a lot of... Uh, New Testament passages very familiar to us that indicate the priority of love in Christianity. 
Jesus once said that the first and foremost commandment is this, that we must love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. And the second commandment is like the first, we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's uh, Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. The Apostle Paul even said about love that that's what fulfills the entire law. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 14. Because if you love your neighbor, you will not rob from him, you won't kill him, you won't covet what he has. And so love is what fulfills the entire law. Paul also said this at the end of the first Corinthians chapter 12 in his letter to the Corinthians. He says, I show you a more excellent way. And that word excellent means that which excels. And he's talking about spiritual gifts there. And he's saying to the Corinthians, there's something that is even more of a priority than having spiritual gifts. And that introduces the next chapter, which is 1 Corinthians 13, and that's the great chapter on love. And at the end of that chapter, verse 13, Paul says, now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. He's saying it's a priority even over faith and hope. And the reason for that is that love continues throughout eternity. Once eternity arrives, we'll no longer walk by faith. We'll walk by sight because we'll have heaven. We no longer hope because we have the reality. Our expectations are realized. But we'll always love throughout eternity. And so we need to learn to love now. It is a priority. James says that love is the royal law. And I think he means by that, that it reigns supreme like a king over every other law. James chapter two and verse eight. And the apostle Peter speaks of the virtue of love as the crowning of all of the, the different uh, Christian graces, the spiritual graces that he lists there in 2 Peter chapter 1 and love is mentioned as the crowning achievement in verse 7. And then John himself, the Apostle John, defines God with just this one word. God is love. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16. So love is a priority. It's what really moves us in the direction of being the kind of disciples that God wants us to be. It is what motivated God to send his son. It is the bottom line to Christianity. And so folks, we need to be people who love one another. But a, a lot of folks in Christianity, in the church today, I think are a little confused about love. They don't fully understand the meaning of love. And that's quite evident in some of the conduct and behavior that I see among some of my brothers. Now we Americans sort of like to make things simple. We like to simplify things. And in so doing, we make things a little more complex, I think. But, uh, you know, we're really caught up in this uh, texting business, you know, with your iPhones and your smartphones and all of that. And um, we like to, uh, you know, narrow things down to just initials. Have you noticed that? Just letters, which stand for whole phrases. Now, if I said, if this was April the 14th, let's assume that it is, you know what comes on April the 15th. If it was April the 14th, what if I said, you better UPS your 1040 to the IRS ASAP. Now you think about that. 
You know what I said, probably, but can you imagine a foreigner trying to learn the English language, hearing something like that? He'd say, say what? But that, that's how we communicate nowadays. We just talk in those little symbols. I learned just recently that when you're texting and if you get an LOL, I thought it meant lots of love, but it doesn't. It means laugh out loud. That's what it means. And see, I was I'm mistaken about that. If you're invited to a party and they text you BYOB, that means bring your own beverage or bring your own booze, depending on the party. Now, if you're a senior citizen like I am, we, we text BYOT when we're inviting people to dinner. That means bring your own teeth. I just wanted to see if you were listening. Some of you have no sense of humor whatsoever. But that's, that's the way we talk. And, and we kind of uh, try to simplify things. And so we have one word, love, that covers a whole lot of territory. I love hot dogs. I love my dog. Same word. I love my dog. I love my wife. Now, folks, I don't recommend you saying those two phrases in the same breath. If you do, you won't see your wife for a week, not till the swelling goes down from the eyes. But we use the same word. But the context helps us to understand that we mean something different about love, depending on what we're discussing. Now, the Greeks were a lot more precise in their language. And, of course, Greek is what the New Testament is written in. The Greeks had four different words that we translate into English by the word love. Let me briefly give those to you. The first one is eros. That's the Greek term. And if you use that Greek term and you say, I love you, you're really saying, I desire you. This is the romantic term for love. This is uh, the, um, uh, the sexual term for love, the intimacy of love. This is where we get our English word erotic. The word eros does not occur in the New Testament, however. A second term is this term storge. And storge is the term for family affection. If you say, I love you, using the word storge, you're saying that I have this natural affection that a father has for a son or daughter and children have for their parents. So we have this natural affection. It's a, a feeling of affection for one another because of our close relationship with one another. Now this word storge is also not found in the New Testament except in a form where it's in a compound form in a word in Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. And there Paul says that we are to be devoted to one another in brotherly love. In that word devoted, you'll find this Greek word storge. And so sometimes that word is translated, I think, by the King James, be kindly affection toward one another or tenderly affection toward one another. And that's what that word means. It's to have feelings toward one another. Now, the third Greek term for love is philia. That's the noun or phileo, that's the verbal form of the noun. And if you use this word and you say, I love you, that means I really like you. This is the term we use for great friendships. You remember that the city of Philadelphia is called the city of brotherly love. And that utilizes the word philia with also the Greek term for brother, adelphos, Philly Adelphos is Philadelphia, and it's the city of brotherly love. At least that's what the name says. I'm not sure about the town itself. They have a lot of crime there. But that's when we like one another. Now, we, this is a common term that you find throughout the New Testament. 
And it's used in a couple of interesting ways. The first way is you say, I love you when you really like someone, so it's used about people. But occasionally, this word is used about things. In fact, Jesus uses this word for love in Matthew, the sixth chapter, in verse five, when he's talking about the scribes and the Pharisees, and they love to pray on the street corners, out there in public, where everybody can see them. In other words, they really like to do that because they like the attention. That's what their religion is all about. It's to be seen of men. In Matthew 23 and uh, verse 6, Jesus says that they love the chief seats at banquets. They like it, in other words. But he uses this term for love, philia. Now, the fourth term, you're already ahead of me, aren't you? That's agape. We're familiar with that. It's the most common term in our Greek New Testaments for the word love. Now, agape is a term that has nothing to do with feelings. It has nothing to do with affection. It really doesn't have anything to do with emotion. Agape is a decision of the mind. It has to do with the intellect and the way you determine how you're going to respond and act toward other people. It's a decision that you make. Now, there are two concepts involved in this word agape. One is that when you agape someone, when you love them, you are seeking the highest good or what is best for that individual that you actually love. Now, Jesus said we, can, we even have to love our enemies. He's not saying that you have to like them. But he has something to say about the decisions you make about them. And so you have to seek what is best even for your enemies. Now, a second aspect of this agape love is this, that you treat people better than they deserve. Now, I'm glad for that because I want to be treated better than I deserve. And, of course, God treats us better than we deserve. This word agape is the term that John uses in John chapter 3 and verse 16 when Jesus, I believe, said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so this love from God, this agape to the world, means that he treats us better than we deserve. And so we are to agape others. Love is a priority with God. Now, in the text that we read just a few moments ago, John employs this word agape. In fact, you'll find it 49 times in his epistle. John is known as the beloved disciple, and he is the one who writes more about love, I think, than any of the other New Testament writers. He really wants us to love one another. In fact, I'm told this is from ancient tradition that when John was an elderly man, this would have been about 96 to 98 AD before he died, he finished out his years in the city of Ephesus and he worshiped with the church there. And they would sometimes carry him because he was too feeble to walk, carry him to the front of the congregation to address the congregation seated in a chair. And he would always say the same thing every Sunday. My little children love one another. It was on his heart. It was on his mind. And I believe it is imperative that we learn to agape love one another. Now in the text, there are three things that I believe John points out that I want you to see tonight. 
about what it means to love one another. Number one, it means that we get along with one another. That's verses 11 through 15. Secondly, it means that we take positive action toward one another. That's verses 16 and 17. And then in verse 18, love in agape way means that we are genuine and sincere in the way that we love and treat one another. So look with me at what John says here in this text about loving one another. First, it means that we get along with one another. Notice in verse 11, he says, here's the message that you've heard from the beginning. The beginning has to be the beginning of Christianity when they were introduced to the good news of Jesus Christ. Love was a part of the message from the very beginning. And so here's what we heard, that we should love one another. That is the bottom line in Christianity. Then he uses an illustration which is sort of surprising because it's a negative illustration. It goes all the way back to the beginning of time when he says, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. Now, if you were ever going to use an illustration about brothers getting along with one another, you wouldn't use Cain and Abel, I wouldn't think. Because here's a man who didn't get along with his brother, Abel. In fact, he hated him. In fact, he hated him so much that he took his life. Now, why would John use that illustration? Why would he talk about Cain and Abel? And he says that Cain was of the evil one. And then he says that Cain's deeds were evil and his brother's, Abel's deeds were righteous. Well, if we back up a little here in chapter 3, we might get an idea as to why John mentions Cain and Abel. In verses 1 through 10, he's contrasting the children of the devil with the children of God. And he notes the difference between them based upon their deeds. If you just read with me verse 9 and 10, listen to what John says. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. That's God's seed abides in the Christian. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. And so he says that the seed of God dwells within us. That word seed is almost like our word DNA. And it means that you bear the qualities and characteristics of your father. And so if you look like, if you're born of God, you have to look like God. And if you don't look like God, then you cannot be born of God. Therefore, you're born of some, someone else. And so the deeds indicate who our father is. We are either righteous and treat one another with love, or we are unrighteous and we don't get along with one another. And so I think Cain and Abel sort of illustrate the children of God versus the children of the devil. Because Cain's deeds were evil and Abel's deeds were righteous. Now, I think there's another reason that John brings in Cain and Abel. Why would Cain kill his brother? And I think this statement that his brother's deeds were righteous and his own deeds were unrighteous or evil is sort of the reason why Cain killed his brother. Have you ever noticed how when you're trying to do what's right, people who are not trying to do what's right resent you? 
And why do they do that? And the reason, I think, is pretty obvious. Your deeds, your striving to do what's right, condemns their deeds. It makes them feel guilty. It makes them feel uncomfortable. And that's why Cain killed his brother Abel. He thought he could silence the condemnation by actually just silencing his brother because his brother and his righteousness condemned Cain's own unrighteousness. Now this principle, I think, is presented uh, by Paul to the Romans in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 when he talks about people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Why, for example, are people who are pro-abortion so vocal about that? Why are homosexuals, why do they come out of the closet and they're so vocal about that? And the reason is righteous behavior condemns them. And they're trying to make their lifestyle acceptable to society so that they don't feel bad about living their unrighteous way of living and they're silencing the condemnation. So they're suppressing the truth by elevating unrighteousness. And that's why I think he uses the example of Cain and Abel. And here's why Cain slew his brother. It's because he was condemned by the righteous behavior of his brother. And so in verse 13, John says, don't be surprised, folks, if the world hates you. Because it will hate you just like Cain hated Abel. And in verse 14, he says, here's the reason we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. And what does he mean by that? Death and life are the two circumstances in which we have existed. When we were not Christians, when we were outside of the Lord, we abided in death. Death just means separation. We were separated spiritually from God because of our sins. But we passed out of death into life because of Christ Jesus. We are now in the life that God wants for us. And when you do that, what are you saying about the former life that you once lived? Whenever you turn your back on something, you're saying, I no longer believe in that. I condemn that. I believe that was wrong. I don't want to live that way anymore. And so that's where the world lives. It abides in death. And when they see you now living righteously, you are condemning their lifestyle. And so the world's going to hate you. And the world is going to oppose you. And so John says you shouldn't be surprised by that. And here's <coughs> the reason we have moved from death into life. It's because we have love for the brethren. That's why? Yes. Because that's the bottom line in Christianity. That's the priority of Christianity. That sums up the Christian life when we love one another. And if we don't have love, John says, we really don't have the life of God. We're still abiding in death. We're still living like the world when we don't live with love. Now in verse 15, John says, everyone who hates his brother, well, he's a murderer. He's just mentioned Cain being a murderer because he hated Abel. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now when you read that, you think, would a Christian kill another Christian? I don't think he means physically. There's more than one way to kill a cat, and there's more than one way to murder a brother. And you can do that by the way that you treat him and talk to him. I have seen some precious souls that I have converted 
become so discouraged by some old biddy in the congregation saying some terrible things to that young Christian that they just got so discouraged and so frustrated that they threw up their hands and quit. That Christian died and he was murdered because there was no love. Sometimes when we just talk about a brother behind the back, his back, we're trying to destroy the image of that brother in the eyes of others, aren't we? That's murder. And so if we engage in that, the life of God cannot be in us because God is love. So the first aspect of loving one another is that we get along with one another. Now, folks, I believe... In this day and age, we need that lesson. I go to a lot of places to preach, and I've seen a lot of division in our fellowship. I believe we're not getting along with one another right now, and the reason is we don't understand what it truly means to love one another. And we're going to have to learn to be gentle with one another, tolerant of one another, and forgiving of one another if we're ever going to get along with one another. But I'm going to move on very quickly. Number two, in verses 16 and 17, John says that agape love and loving one another means that we take positive action toward one another. How did we come to learn love? Verse 16 reminds us that we know love by this, that he, that's Jesus, lay down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We learned love by what Christ did for us. He took positive action toward us when we desperately needed it and when we did not deserve it. We were not righteous. We were ungodly and sinful when our Lord gave his life to pay the ransom for our sins. So we need to learn from that, and we need to lay down our lives for the brothers. Now, I don't know that you and I will ever be called upon to actually give up our physical life for a brother, but would you be willing to do that? In the first century, they quite often were called upon to do that. But I believe that when John list the ultimate uh, positive action you could take, the ultimate, then all the lesser things listed underneath that also are applied by this principle. Whatever applies to the greatest also applies to the lesser things. And so he talks about uh, taking of our world goods when you see someone in verse 17, <coughs> whoever has the world's goods and beholds his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? And so when you see someone in need, you don't have to give your life, you just have to give up of some of your worldly goods. Are you willing to do that? That's taking positive action toward one another. This is going beyond just getting along with one another. We're doing something to benefit one another. It costs us something to love one another. Now let me help you out, if I can, with how to accomplish that. Three little principles. Number one, I like to apply the me first principle. And by that I mean, when you see someone in need, a brother or sister, you take the initiative. You go first. Don't wait for someone else to respond to the need. Don't get a committee together and say the church ought to do something. If you have the wherewithal in the world's goods, then do it. Just take the initiative, me first. A few weeks ago, I learned that one of our folks in the congregation, he's a man of about 60 years of age now, when he was about 25, he had an accident with a Jeep. Turned it over, rolled down a mountain, I think, and it messed him up terribly. He cannot 
reason like he used to. He can barely communicate. He cannot drive and all kinds of problems as a result of that accident. Well, for the almost 30 years that I've known him, he has ridden a bicycle to come to church and everywhere he goes downtown to the post office and everything. But now he's of an age where he started having accidents. He'd come to church and he was all black and blue. And uh, I asked him what happened and you can barely understand him because of the slurred speech. But he just loses his balance now. There's, he's deteriorating physically. And I was talking with one of the brothers about that. I, I said, oh, Alan has been having accidents. And he said, yeah, what he needs is a three-wheel bicycle. I never thought of that. So I said to my wife, get on the internet, find out what one of those things cost, and if we have the wherewithal, let's just get him one of those three-wheeled bikes. Well, I left to go preach a meeting, and that Sunday when I was gone, this brother that I had talked to announced that Alan needed a new bike. By the time church was over, he had enough funds, almost a thousand dollars, to buy that new bike. And I was away. And when I got home, I said, uh, we're going to get Alan this bike. He said, it's already taken care of. And uh, I said, well, let me contribute. I didn't get, he said, we got more money than we need. You see, when you're in a congregation where everybody thinks me, for, me first, it's hard to be me first and help folks. But why not take the initiative and do that? Here's a second principle. Follow the golden rule. Do unto others what you would like for them to do to you if you were in that situation. I think the way to implement the golden rule is to think about what it would be like if you were in their circumstance and what would they need in that circumstance and then fill that need. I remember back in the 1960s reading of a brother who uh, heard of a young widow in his congregation. A, a man had just died, a young man, and he left a young widow and three children. And he wasn't a man of any financial means, but he wanted to help. He understood the plight of that circumstance, and he knew that plenty of food would be given by the ladies of the congregation. So he showed up the day before the funeral of her husband and knocked on the door. The house was filled with family and uh, grieving. And he said, I'm brother so-and-so, and I just want to say how sorry I am. And I got to thinking that, you know, at a funeral, one of the things that people don't have time to take care of or don't think about is their shoes. And I brought my shoe polishing kit, and I'd like to polish your shoes. Can you imagine that? And she was flabbergasted, and she said, well, okay. And she gave him a pair of shoes, and he went back in the back room. And the next day, when she went to her closet, every pair of shoes had been polished. In her closet, in her husband's closet, in her children's closet. That's practicing the golden rule. That's loving a brother. Positive action toward them. And so I think when we have the me first attitude and then we have the golden rule principle, if we add the giving without getting principle, we'll have it down right. You know, a lot of people will give if they'll get something out of that. In the business world, it's, I'll scratch your back if you scratch my back. In other words, we'll only do this if we get something in return. Sometimes we bring that into the church, but I would sus uh, hope that we would learn to give without getting. Sometimes it's just, I want the praise for it. 
like Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. The other day, after church, one of our brothers handed me an envelope. I knew what it was. I knew there was a check inside. We train preachers there in Durango. And when I have a full complement, which is just three men, we provide all of the support, rent the house and the utilities, and then support these men. It's about $14,000 a month. Now, we only have 50 people in our congregation. We're not very big. And so it takes uh, some effort for all of us to uh, support this program of training preachers. Well, he handed me an envelope, and then he whispered in my ear, this is from Brother Anonymous. He had done that before. And usually it's about $3,000 or $4,000 that he gives me. I opened the envelope, and it was $12,000. I couldn't believe it. And he didn't want any recognition, is what he was saying, by this is from Brother Anonymous. And I tell you, this is just a blue-collar worker. He is not a rich man, but he uses his money to the Lord's glory. Let's learn to be givers without getting. Well, I've got to hurry. Um, the third uh, point that uh, John makes here is that our love must be genuine and sincere. Did you remember what he said in verse 18? Little children, let us love not with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Now, word and tongue just means just saying I love you. Now, I think we need to say that more. I was talking with a preacher brother just uh, on Saturday on the way up, and when he closed out, he says, I love you, brother. He could say it before I could get it out, and I love you too, I said. We ought to do that more. But someone has said, talk is cheap. It's pretty easy to say I love you, but it's a whole different story to show somebody that you love them. And you only have <clears throat> genuine and sincere love if you have the deeds and the truth involved in the love, not just the word. Some love is hypocritical. You know, the Greek word for hypocrite, it is the word hypocrite, is really the word for actor. And that meant that the Greek actor would put a mask in front of his face. He was hiding his true self because he's now putting on a show. He's acting out. And sometimes we'll say, I love you, but we don't really mean it. Talk is cheap, but demonstration will cost you something. And so J John is saying that we need to demonstrate our love for one another in genuineness. Now, folks, I believe that we don't really love one another when we talk behind one another's back, when we really are trying to destroy one another in the minds of other people because we have some problem with a brother or sister. Wouldn't it be demonstrating of the fact that we actually love them if we have a problem with a brother to go to that brother. Now, why is it that we say, I love you, and then talk about him behind his back? It's because it's easier, it costs you something to go to a brother and confront one another. It's going to be very uncomfortable. You don't know how he's going to respond or anything like that. And so because of the high cost of demonstrating our love, sometimes we can be very hypocritical. Uh, there are times when people carry grudges. I knew of a grudge in a congregation between a couple of families that lasted for 20 years. I couldn't believe it. They wouldn't speak with one another. One family would sit on this side and the other people would sit on that side. And we sing about love and they might say, oh yeah, we love them. But they didn't demonstrate it. I think that's kind of hypocritical. And so John is telling us, folks, we must be genuine. So what are we going to do with this lesson? What are you going to do with this? You're going to say, oh, that's okay. Or are you going to say, I'm going to treat my brothers 
better. I'm going to get along with my brothers. I'm going to take positive action toward my brothers, especially those in need. And I'm going to love my brothers in genuineness. Can you do that? That's what God did for us. And if we are children of God, if his seed resides within us, if that's what begat us, then we're going to exhibit the same characteristic of God. This evening, we're going to offer the invitation. If anyone has a need in a public way to respond, we welcome you to come and we'll help you in any way that we can while we stand and sing together.